Am I switched on? Oh, yes, I am. Oh, yes, that's loud enough. So in the early 80s, when my husband and I first became Christians, when we were first saved, there was a popular Christian song called An Army of Ordinary People. Now, I'm looking around today, and I can see a lot of ordinary people, but I'm not too sure about the army. Um, it could be that it's an underground army, you know, just infiltrating quietly into society at the moment. But there's a line in the book that we're studying, Gentle and Lowly, about startling the world with unexpected kindness. And I love that idea of just startling the world with some unexpected kindness. Now, ordinary doesn't mean useless, because God's hand is evidence in the daily round, the common task. And what I want us to think about today is God choosing ordinary people like us and then directing our lives to be part of his plan, even when we don't realize that God is behind what is happening. So this morning, I'd like us to take a brief look at the book of Ruth. Now, I love a good story, and one that starts with once upon a time and ends with, and they all lived happily ever after. And actually, the book of Ruth in the message translation does start with once upon a time. Now, it's a story of hardship and tragedy, but with a happy ending. The book of Ruth has all of those ingredients. Now, the book opens with in the days when the judges ruled. Now, in the nation of Israel, this was a time of moral chaos and national instability. Sound a bit familiar? Sound a bit like the world today? The book of Judges ends with the words, In those days, Israel had no king, and everyone did as they saw fit. Then we turn over the page to the book of Ruth. It's as if the camera moves away from the big picture. What's going on in the corridors of influence and power? And the camera just zooms in on a very ordinary family. A man called, a man from Bethlehem who was called Elimelech, his wife Naomi, and their two sons, Marlon and Kilion. At that time, there was a famine in the land. So Elimelech made the unwise decision to leave a starving Bethlehem and take his family to Moab. Now, we can't be sure what prompted this decision. Perhaps it was desperation to provide for his family, when really he should have stayed and trusted God. However, we know that our foolishness cannot set aside the purposes of God. He is able to work out his purposes and bring about good in the lives of his people in spite of our mistakes. Now, Moab was about 100 miles north of Jerusalem. And it was not listed as an ideal holiday hotspot for Israelites. It was a pagan land where people worshipped the god Chemosh and practiced child sacrifice. Now, tragedy struck. Elimelech died. The two sons married Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. Then after about 10 years, the two sons also die, leaving three widows with no social status no economic means to survive, and a desperate situation to find themselves in. At this point, Naomi learns that the Lord has come to the help of his people back in Bethlehem, so she decides to return there. C.S. Lewis said, hardships often prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. So that is what is about to happen here. We find the three women on the road that would take them back to the land of Judah. And I'm going to read from verse 8 to 15. Then Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's home. May the Lord show kindness to you, as you shown to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant that each of you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept, and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi said, Return home, my daughters. Why would you come with me? Am I going to have more sons who would become your husbands? Return home, my daughters. I am too old to have another husband. Even if I thought there was still hope for me, even if I had a husband tonight and then gave birth to sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you remain unmarried for them? No, my daughters. It is more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord's hand has gone out against me. 
Naomi urges her two daughters-in-law to return to their own mothers, and she's facing them with a choice, and it's a risk for them. They can either go forward with God and nothing, you know, no guarantees in Bethlehem, or have everything physical provided for them in Moab, but without God. Now, there are times when we also have to make that choice. Follow God and trust that he will provide or trust ourselves and our own ability. God does not want a half-hearted commitment. He was looking for people who will say, as Ruth goes on to, your God will be my God. Orpah makes the decision to go back, but Ruth decides to stay. Verse 14. At this, Orpah kissed her mother-in-law goodbye, but Ruth clung to her. Look, said Naomi, your sister-in-law is going back to her people and her gods. Go back with her. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go, and where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if anything but death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Now, Ruth was a real gift to Naomi. She was making that choice to trust in God, and they went back to Bethlehem. The people, when they got there, could hardly believe it was Naomi. If we read um, verses 20 to 21, don't call me Naomi, she told them. These are the people of Bethlehem, because they just didn't know it was her. Call me Mara, because the Lord's hand has made me very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. Now I find her words very sad, because Naomi, the name means beautiful. But Mara means bitter. The Lord has afflicted me. Now, I think we can all appreciate how she would feel because when you've had one tragedy after another that pounds your faith, it's very easy to lose hope. But let me read to you the words of the Heidelberg Catechism. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God. He desires to do this because he is a faithful father. Now that's what we should be believing, what we should be thankful for and trusting God with. But I'm sure that we have days where a bit like Mara, call me Mara, days when everything's going wrong. I think sometimes I'm just having a little bit of a pity party, you know, it's like, oh, call me Mara. Yeah, sorry. But can you remember that little song we used to sing as kids? Nobody likes me, everybody hates me, I'm going down the garden to eat worms. Well, I have to confess, I do still occasionally have a worm eating day. Not very often, I have to say. Days when I'm listening to the lies of the enemy instead of being thankful for what I've got. But moving on quickly with the story. Ruth isn't one for sitting about moping and feeling sorry for herself. She gets up, gets dressed, and goes out to find work. Now, God, in his laws, had made provision for the poor when it was harvest time. The poor could follow behind the harvesters and pick up any grain that was left over, because this was God demonstrating his compassion for the poor. Now, it's not by chance that Ruth chooses the field of Boaz to work in. This is all of God's leading. And Boaz is the hero of the story. He instructs his workers to leave plenty of grain and tells Ruth to stay in his field. He's kind to her, in spite of her being a foreigner, making sure that Ruth always has enough to glean. God is at work in every circumstance, whether we see it or not. Now, Boaz is an older man. He's a good man and he's kind to his employees. When Ruth tells Naomi whose field she's working in, ooh, well, that's when Naomi's eyes light up because she says, oh, well, 
Is it? Boaz then? Mm. He's one of our close relatives. He's one of our kinsmen redeemers. And that's when Naomi decides to be a matchmaker and get Ruth and Boaz fixed up, telling Ruth in chapter 3 to wash and perfume herself and put on your best clothes. When Boaz goes to lie down on the, to sleep on the threshing floor, go, uncover his feet, and lie down. Now, that plan could have gone disastrously wrong. However, Boaz, our hero, is a godly man, a man of integrity, so he doesn't take advantage of the situation. Now, my late son-in-law, he used to tease me in a good-hearted way that I had fixed him up with my younger daughter. It's actually true, because when we were at the Ford Church, I asked the vicar at Christ Church if he could re recommend any speakers for us, and he suggested Seth. After Seth came along to preach, and after chatting, I discovered he wasn't married. And at that time, my younger daughter was a nurse, but she was working in a residential home for severely disabled children in a small village down south, so she didn't have any opportunity to meet eligible men. And that was when I was a bit like Naomi. I invited Seth for lunch, when I knew that Helen would be home. And then, after lunch, my husband and I just had to pop out on some errand, <laughs> leaving them alone. And the rest, they say, is history. But sadly, Seth is no longer here to tease me. But he left us three lovely grandchildren and some good memories. I like to picture that Boaz was a bit like Seth, a big man with a big heart. But according to Mosaic law, the kinsman redeemer has the right to marry the widow if there was no son. So that's what happened. Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, married Ruth, who then gave birth to Obed. Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of King David. And David was in the line of the Messiah. So Ruth, you see, this ordinary woman, then became an ancestor of Jesus, the Messiah. Because God, in his grace, drew her in. If we look at the end of the story in um, chapter 4, verses 14 to 17, the women said to Naomi, Praise be to the Lord who has this day not left you without a kinsman redeemer. May he become famous throughout Israel. He will renew your life and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you and who is better to you than seven sons has given him birth. Then Naomi took the child, laid him in her lap and cared for him. The, woman, the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Psalm 30 verse 5 says, Weeping may last for the night, but shouts of joy come in the morning. So whatever you're going through at this moment, there will be joy to come in this life or the next. As surely as he looked after Ruth and Naomi, he is looking after you. So what about us? Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He is our brother, the only one good enough to pay the price for us. And we've been redeemed not with silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. The story of Naomi, Ruth and Boaz is a foreshadow of our relationship with our kinsman redeemer because we are the bride of Christ. In chapter 8 of the book, Gentle and Lowly, we learn that Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him. Bunyan the old Puritan writer based his book, Christ, A Complete Saviour, on verse 7 in Hebrews in chapter 25. I can just turn to that one. Chapter 7 and verse 25. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He is able to save to the uttermost, those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. The phrase to the uttermost is a word denoting comprehensiveness, completeness, exhaustive wholeness. We are to the uttermost sinners 
So we need a to the uttermost saviour. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. See, Dane Ortland says in the book Gentle and Lowly, to the uttermost means God's forgiving, redeeming, restoring touch reaches down into the darkest crevice of our souls, those places where we are most ashamed and most defeated, because Jesus ever lives to make it in session for us. The Lord Jesus is praying for us right now at the throne of the Father, praying because we continue to fail while we're here on earth. I'm just going to ask the band if they would come back up now. If you could picture a glider pulled up into the sky by an aeroplane, soon to be released to float down to earth. We are that glider, and Christ is the plane. But he never disengages. He never lets go, wishing us well, hoping we can glide the rest of the way into heaven. He carries us all the way. What a marvellous thought that is. You know, no matter how bad you've been, no matter what kind of a week you've had, no matter how awful things seem, Jesus is interceding and he's praying for you right now. Ordinary people? Yes, we are. But we have an extraordinary Father God and an extraordinary Saviour. Our lives are not ordinary because we are part of the purpose of God and that makes us extraordinary. Ruth found favour in the eyes of Boaz. And we, undeserving as we are, have found favour in the eyes of Almighty God. May the Lord bless you.